start a new tradition. We're going to do Dress Down Tuesday. So <coughs> I'm a new traditioner. Sorry, but these are my traveling clothes. So i got to go right to the airport. If I'm going to be you know, on a plane for the next God knows how many day and a half, you got to dress comfortably. So um, we're going back to Paris. So, of course, this is the Eiffel Tower. And um, they've got a little plaza where you can, like, look over it and, and, and see it. And then this was nice. This was at a restaurant, and we actually um, stayed there on a typical French meal. You know, it's a four-hour meal. And so the nice thing is, is, is the Eiffel Tower lights up um, in the dark, and then every hour on the hour, the lights go crazy. And so I tried to catch that, but it's really hard with just a regular one. Yeah, hard to catch it doing that. But in any event, you know, you're there for like four hours, so you get to see this happen four times. So it's worth at least seeing it once to see the lights every hour. They did this for the bicent for the uh, millennium, and then people liked it so much they decided they're just going to keep doing it. So keep doing it so every hour from like whatever seven until midnight it it goes off and goes crazy so people love that okay today we're going to talk about the cornea <coughs> all right so we've got wow ophthalmic pathology fellow bright eyed and bushy tail <laughs> now tell me about the layers of the cornea so again what's our main theme about ophthalmology it has layers, layers. okay so what are the layers starting from out to in Okay. And then there's Bowman's layer, which is not a basement membrane. And then uh, we have the stroma, and then our Desmase membrane, and endothelium. Okay, so what stain is this? Um, this is a PAS stain. And how can you say that? Because Bowman's isn't stained by Desmase. Exactly, and so it's a good way to remember, a, you know, Bowman's layer is not a basement membrane. Decimase membrane is. And so if you do a PAS stain, you see that Decimase membrane stains this nice kind of magenta color, whereas you see Bowman's layer up at the top is still pink. All right, so let's talk about some of the layers here. All right, Ariana, tell me about the epithelium. It's a stratified squamous. <coughs> okay, about how many layers thick is it? Five to seven. Okay, so you can see it's about five to seven layers thick. Keratin or no? No. No keratin, all right. And then what layer is this right here? It's uh, Bowman's. Bowman's layer. And so, you know, as you see, Bowman's layer, it's really a condensed almost stroma. And the important thing you remember is Bowman's layer does not regenerate. And so if you have an injury or an infection or something that causes either break or loss of Bowman's layer, it does not regenerate. So it's kind of historical record of what's happened to that, to that part of the cornea. And then we're looking right here. Um, Rachel, why are we doing this stain again? What stain is this? PAS stain. Why would I do this? It doesn't, but what does stain on here? Exactly. And so what this shows is it shows the epithelium has a basement membrane. So right under the epithelium, you see that line of staining, and then Bowman's layer underneath that does not stain. So Bowman's layer is not the basement membrane of the epithelium. The epithelium has a separate basement membrane. And so this PAS stain shows nicely the thin layer under the epithelium, the epithelial basement membrane, and then Bowman's layer underneath that. Now, let's go, let's go back a little bit to, no, no, obviously that's not gonna happen. So, stroma, all right, pretty unexciting part of the cornea. Marshall, what, um, what is the stroma <coughs> comprised of? Um, collagen fibrils and um, big fibroblasts also. Well, it's, it's actually keratocytes. And so these little spindly-shaped nuclei are the keratocytes, which 
are normally quiescent in a cornea. So they're spindly shaped, you have these lamellae of collagen. Now what's interesting is they run from limbus to limbus. And that's why the cornea is so strong. So they run from limbus to limbus, it's very strong. Now, if you injure the cornea or disrupt the cornea, these keratocytes can become like fibroblasts. And so they can start laying down collagen. But the problem is, is once you do that, the collagen will not be that nice, regular limbus to limbus collagen. It'll be shorter and it won't quite be as strong. And so once you've made an incision in the cornea, even though it rehealed, it's never as strong as the original cornea. And so there's some other things. There's some glucopolysaccharides and some other material that's in there, but mainly it's collagen and it is these um, you know, keratocytes that are in there. Now, why is the cornea clear? A couple reasons why the cornea transmits light. Um, because it's at the appropriate hydration. Okay, so, it's, so exactly, so it's dehydrated, so it's not you know, full of fluid, and so if you get any fluid in the cornea, of course it becomes cloudy. Chris, what's another reason why the cornea is transparent, the stroma? Because of the way the other part of the ring is very irregular. Exactly. So if you look at them on, on, say, electron microscopy, they're very regularly arrayed so light can come through them. The sclera, on the other hand, is white, but it's made up of the same stuff. But the scleral fibers are not regularly arrayed, and the sclera has fluid in it, and so it's not detergent. So that's why the sclera is white. Stroma is not. All right, now we're looking at the posterior here, alley. So again, what layer is this right here on the posterior? And then what's in what's outside of the endothelium? This means membrane. And so if we look at that closer up, there's the endothelium, there's decimase membrane. So remember we said decimase membrane is PAS positive. It truly is a base membrane, but if you look at this amazing membrane with electron microscopy, there are two different <coughs> layers. There's a, a banded and a non-banded. So the anterior banded part of Decimase membrane is, is the part that's there from early on. And then throughout life, those endothelial cells lay down more Decimase membrane. And so it becomes what we call non-banded if you look at EM. And so throughout life, Decimase membrane actually thickens a little bit. Now, looking at the endothelial layer here, the endothelial layer is a very busy layer. It does lots of things. Uh, Teresa, what are the junctions like in the endothelial layer between each of the cells? They're tight. They're tight junctions, exactly. And so this is where you get um, a barrier to fluid pouring into the cornea. So you've got all the aqueous fluid in there. If you didn't have tight junctions here, the cornea would be constantly edematous. And so those tight junctions really help to you know, keep the cornea detergest. Now, if you look at them in a, in a sagittal section like this, they look cuboidal, but if you look at them in 3D, they're actually hexagonal. And in fact, if you look at the, the corneal endothelium, it's like a geodesic dome. And geodesic dome is, is nature's way of covering a curved surface. And so if you look at these, they're actually hexagonal and they interlink together nicely like a geodesic dome does. Now, not only do they have tight junctions, Sneha, what else do endothelial cells do? They do make decimase membrane. Okay, well, you would think of that. Yeah, that's a good answer. All right, well, that counts. Ariana, what else do they do? Well, I would think that they, um, like they also help to dehydrate by transport. Exactly. So they actually try to pump fluid out of the cornea. So if you still have them, they pump fluid out. Rachel, what's another thing that they do? They actually transport nutrients from the aqueous into the cornea. So there's truly transportation going on. So they'll transport nutrients in there also. So in order to have a clear cornea, you've really got to have a good functioning endothelial layer. All right, let's look at some, some different diseases here. Marshall, what do we see in here? <coughs> so there's an external photograph of the, uh, like the left eye, and you see a hazy, almost grayish uh, covering on what looks to be covering the epithelium of the cornea in a band-like fashion. Um, you know, could, <coughs> not sure what is it, it is, but it could be band keratopathy. Okay, what is band keratopathy? Um, it's deposition of calcium in the cornea. 
Where in the cornea does the calcium deposit? Uh, I believe it's above bowman's. Or even in bowman's. And so it's along there. It's, it's down along the, below the epithelium and along bowman's layer. And if you notice, it's in the palpebral fissure, thus it forms a band. And so there really is calcium depositing from the tears into this area. And, and why, you know, this is really nonspecific. This can be a sign of any kind of chronic inflammation. And so you see it's in a band in the palpebral fissure where the tears will, will deposit their material. And so when we look at it, um, Chris, what are these little dark spaces here in the, in the band keratopathy? Those are the spots where the corneal nerves come in. Exactly. So the corneal nerves come into the anterior stroma, kind of along Bowman's, and they pop up to the epithelium. So those little round areas where the corneal nerves pop up, there's no calcium right in there. So there'll be these little um, blank areas that do that. And I'm sorry, this is sideways. I should have turned it around. But there's the epithelium there. There's some connective tissue underneath it. And then that's all along Bowman's layer, both above and, and below it. Allie, what stain is this? It's like oil rash. Well, that would stain oil. So what is this material? Calcium. There's a red in the stain because it is red. Lizarin red. red. All right, very good. So this is a lizarin red, which stains for calcium. So you can see bad keratopathy here. But often, bad keratopathy is secondary to some kind of a chronic inflammation. So. Not only do you have band keratopathy, it's very rare to have just band keratopathy, but you've got this area right here where there's this kind of dense fibrous tissue between the epithelium and Bowman's layer. What do you think that could be? <coughs> Sam? Panis. A panis. All right. So as we look right here, sometimes during chronic inflammation, you can get material growing out between epithelium and Bowman's layer, and it's called a panis. You can have a fibrous panis, where it's mostly fibrous tissue, you can have a vascularized panis, you can even have an inflammatory type panis or a mixture. So this is what we would call a vascular panis. So epithelium on the top, Bowman's layer underneath, and all this vascularized material in between. Again, a sign of chronic inflammation. So often you'll see band keratopathy and panis running together because they're both signs of chronic inflammation. Here you have band keratopathy here some calcium granules up there, and then this dense fibrous tissue in between. So fibrous panis with band keratopathy. All right, what are we looking at right here, Ariana? Uh, almost at the level of the corneal is not clear. There's a whitish, hazy part there. Okay, so what do you think that is? Exactly. So this is they call arcus senilis, but the word senile is bad now, so we need to say arcus. What's it made of? Uh, lipid. Lipid. And so whenever you see a clear space and then something, it's a deposition. And so it's coming from the limbus, and then it diffuses and then deposits in the stroma. So you see a little clear space between that and the limbus. And, you know, if you look at people as they're older, I mean, almost everybody has an arcus of some kind. So you see an arcus. And double bonus points, what kind of stain is this? Here's our oil red O. Oil red O. And what do you have to do with the tissue in order to get <coughs> it to work? It has to be fresh stuff. Exactly. It has to be fresh. And so, interestingly enough, you get deposition of this lipid. It's more anterior and more posterior and not quite so much in the middle. So if you hallucinate, you know, pathologists sniff a lot of formalin, and so they're good at hallucinating things, they say this is an hourglass pattern. So it's kind of wider at the bottom and then less in the middle and then wider at the top. And so this is the deposition of lipid in the stroma is kind of an hourglass pattern. All right, Rachel, what are we seeing here? There's fluorescein stain on the front of the eye and um, it's truly picking up a couple of spots, including like a large dendritic pattern. All right, so what is usually the the cause of this dendritic staining like this? Herpes. All right. More specific? Usually herpes simplex. Yeah. And then type 1 or type 2? Type 1. Type 1, but could be 2. I mean, could be. So, again, I'm going to give you guys some, some pearls here. So whenever anybody asks you a question about anything in the cornea, 
they say, what's in the differential diagnosis? And you say offhandedly, well, of course, herpes. Just say it offhandedly because herpes, and they'll go, oh, yeah. So if you don't know what the answer is, just say, well, of course, herpes. Because that's in every differential diagnosis. So these are pearls now. Remember these. But you have to say it offhandedly, like, well, of course, herpes. And then they'll say, well, simplex or zoster? And you say, well, simplex, but could be zoster. You know, sometimes zoster can cause these. Although, if you see the dendritic pattern with the little kind of raised bulbous edges, that's usually simplex. But zoster can give you some staining, but it doesn't look like this. So this is usually herpes simplex that causes this. And when we look at it, you'll get a little area of ulceration in the epithelium, and then you'll get some stromal inflammation, but you can also have a more of a stromal herpes. And then this is thought to be more autoimmune than actual active infection. And if you look real carefully, you'll even see epithelioid cells down here um, in the deeper, deeper stroma. And so you can get a more epithelial herpes. And the cornea guys will talk to you at this at length because you know the different ways that herpes can present and whether it's infectious or it's, a, or it's an immune reaction. And there you can see the giant cells down there along decimase membrane. So this is the more stromal herpes that you can see. And that's just kind of cool because this was a scraping they did. And you can see the uh, epithelial inclusions that you see in herpes. Now you guys have, you know, PCR tests. You can just scrape it and send it off and you get them right away. But, you know, before we had that, you'd do scrapings and you'd look at them. This is almost like a pap stain. And so you'd look at them and you'd see these inclusions that would be signs of herpes involvement. Marsha, what are we seeing here? <coughs> um, there's diffuse injection, some chemosis, and uh, <clears throat> neovascularization, 360, as well as a cloudy um, cornea with an irregular surface. Um, not sure what the diagnosis is. All right, so this is actually a corneal ulcer. And so this is a really nasty looking one. This turned out to be Pseudomonas. So this is a patient that didn't take care of their contacts and got them contaminated. So this is a bacterial corneal ulcer. And it's very important to recognize these because especially an aggressive bacteria like Pseudomonas eludes um, collagenases, proteinases, things that melt corneas. And so you can melt a cornea in 24 hours with a, with a nasty corneal bacterial infection. So you got to recognize these right away. When we look at the pathology, what happened to this cornea? Um, looks like the epithelium is gone. Most of, like half of the stroma is gone also. Um, it's severely thinned. What else? Um, there's almost like a penetrating wound. Exactly. So it perforated. So if you look right here, you can see that there is an actual area of perforation here. And if you look, it's not that nice pink stroma. It's white and it's pale. And so what's happened is, is it just completely melted. And so this had a, a severe bacterial ulcer of the cornea melted and then perforated. And what kind of inflammatory cells do you usually see in a bacterial ulcer? PMNs, lymphos, PMNs usually, so acute inflammatory cells. And so you can see in here lots and lots and lots of neutrophils, PMNs. Now you can still have lymphocytes in here or plasma cells, but there's acute inflammatory cells. There's lots of PMNs in here. So it's an acute in infection. So when you treat it, not only does the bacteria cause the cornea to melt and become opacified, but the PMNs that come in to fight it, they dump out a lot of materials from their granules that can also cause the cornea to melt and to opacify. So, you know, that's good if it's in the skin and you've got an infection and the body's immune system attacks it and cleans it up, but in the cornea where you want it to be clear, that's not good. And so you want to really kill those bacteria as rapidly as you can. And so this is truly an ophthalmic emergency. You know, you want to treat them with fortified antibiotics or antibiotics. We're talking every hour to two hours for the first, you know, 24 to 48 hours or they can, you can melt the cornea. All right, Chris, what do we see in here? This is external photo. Um, you always see some kenosis, some injection, and then cornea, uh, cloudy essentially, and there's this uh, white specification. It looks like it could be another infiltrate, uh, potentially another ulcer. Yeah. 
So there's an ulcer and infiltrate, and then you see this little rim of haze around it. Now I'll give you a hint. This is uh, an Idaho potato farmer. <clears throat> that's eye's been irritating him for about a week. <coughs> um, so you think it might be about something a little bit more indolent, something like fungus could be this. Okay, so when you see a more indolent ulcer like this, you think something less than bacteria, but something more like fungus. And so when you have more indolent, especially someone who works, you know, farmers, ranchers, or sometimes people will say, oh, I was out hiking, and I don't know, I was in the garden, something got in my eye, and so they'll often have some kind of a vegetative exposure. And what is this stain? GMS, so Gamori methenamine silver, so it stains fungi silvery black. So you see the little yeasty beasties or the little ones staining black up there. So this is a chronic fungal ulcer. Allie, this is a patient um, treated by an ophthalmologist for herpes for about two or three weeks, didn't get better, hurts. Lots of pain, lots of light sensitivity. It's not even a fluorescein stain, but you can see a chronic area of epithelial abrasion there. What do you think this could be? Um, there's an area of like more consolidated infiltrate that's in a ring, so it's kind of acanthamoeba. All right, so this is a classic acanthamoeba. It's the ring infiltrate, chronic non-healing ulcer, often misdiagnosed early on as as a herpes infection. And what's the stain? I don't, I don't know if I even showed you guys this in our staining talk. Well, bonus points if you know the stain for acanthamoeba. Gridley, because gridley stains green. Okay, so gridley green. So it'll stain the stroma green, but it'll stain the cyst walls, kind of a silvery black. And the problem why these are so difficult to treat is that they insist. So once they insist, it's really tough to get the medicine in them to kill them. They're very resistant to that. So you want to recognize these early on because these um, beasts can get into the nerves. They can start to go in beyond the cornea into the sclera. And so you really want to recognize this early and treat it. Nowadays, you, you've got good treatment available. Basically, you, you, swimming pool disinfectant drops is what you use. But there is another material that you can order. You have to order it from, from England, propamidine, proline. And, um, but usually now you can get the, the swimming pool disinfectant and that'll treat this. And so this is the gridley green stain that stains the acanthamoeba cysts. And usually the patient will have some kind of exposure to standing water or something. Um, you know, don't put your face in a hot tub, by the way. You can do this. Um, I had a young kid who was a wrestler and more contacts. And the reason I say that is, you know, wrestlers, these guys will like not wash their sweats for the whole season, you know? So they have, so he had acanthamoeba growing in the case. We actually swabbed his contact case and he had acanthamoeba in the case. So, you know, he ended up getting a really nasty infection. And this is an EM showing you it's actually a triple walled cyst and so very, very resistant to treatment once it insists. All right. I guess we're back around to Sneha. What do we see in here? So I think we're seeing um, some anterior via the anterior chambers. Um, looks like some like scrolling or kind of like dots, holes. Yeah, so this is actually <coughs> under the epithelium. And so this is, we're going to start talking a little bit of, of some kind of uh, dystrophies. And so this is an epithelial basement membrane dystrophy, and they'll often call this map dot fingerprint. And so you'll see, you can kind of hallucinate some little map lines or some fingerprint lines there. Then you go here, here again with the light on the side, it looks like fingerprint. So this is an epithelial basement membrane dystrophy, or they'll call it map dot fingerprint dystrophy, because that's what it'll look like. Previous one looked like a map, this looks like fingerprints. There'll be little dots in there. The, you know, here you can see against retroillumination the little dots. The reason that these are important, and I apologize, this is a bad picture. And actually, I shouldn't apologize because it's the fellows took this. And so if it's, <coughs> it's bad, the fellows did it. If it looks really good, I do it. So, so that's how we did it. Same thing when I, I show surgical videos at a meeting. The case looks great. I did it. If it's a complicated case, we say, oh, yeah, that was the resident doing that. So. 
You're supposed to smile when you see it. <laughs> All right, so basically this is a dystrophy where the basement membrane gets thickened, it gets irregular, and because of that, you can get chronic recurrent erosions. So these people will often wake up at, you know, five in the morning and they'll open their eyes and then suddenly they'll get an acute pain and watering and so they'll get erosions from this. So this is an epithelial basement membrane dystrophy. Yes? What are all those layers? It looks like as if there's like basement membrane oh, repeatedly. Exactly. So you'll get an ulceration you'll, that'll pop and then you'll get cells that'll heal over that. So you'll get actually duplication of basement membrane in several different layers when this happens. So this is a sign they've had multiple recurrent erosions from the epithelial basement membrane dystrophy. And this just shows you, this is a patient who had a scraping. And if you look at it, here is the epithelium that's scraped off. Look at the basement membrane. Remember I showed you the general path, you know, basement membranes little tiny thin ribbon. Look at how thick that basement membrane is. And so when you have the basement membrane dystrophies, it's <coughs> tremendously thickened. And there's a close-up. All of that material underneath there, that pink material, is thick basement membrane, so massively thickened. All right, um, Ariana, what are we seeing here? I'm thinking that we're translimiting from the side again, and we see all these... <coughs> Yeah, so there's multiple little dots all over the place. So this is a little bit deeper than the epithelial basement membrane, but still really anterior. What could this be? Another dystrophy. Another dystrophy. Which dystrophy is characterized by anterior dots? Miesmann. Miesmann's. And Miesmann's is interesting because you get this weird basement membrane-like stuff deposited, and the clever pathologist years ago called this and I quote, peculiar substance. That's the name of this stuff. So it's called peculiar substance. And so it's a dystrophy where you get deposition anteriorly of a basement membrane-like material that forms these little dots. It's Miesmann's dystrophy. Um, Rachel. Regular, not really dots, still anterior. What's another anterior dystrophy that can give you a picture like this? Mm, not usually. Mm, still more, and this is still anterior. We're still not quite in the stroma yet. It's called Ries Buchler dystrophy. And so this is a more anterior dystrophy and you will get deposition of material anteriorly in the area of Bowman's layer. And so this is, again, anterior type dystrophy. And there are different types of Reese buchler And so you can, you know, when you get into cornea, you'll study the different types. But really, it's a deposition of material that kind of takes over Bowman's, I mean, uh, Bowman's layer. It's, a, it's an anterior dystrophy. All right, so now I want to talk about stromal dystrophies. And... Marshall, there's a mnemonic that we have you guys all memorize that tell us the stromal dystrophies. What's the mnemonic? Um, something about Marilyn Monroe getting her way in L.A. I'm not exactly. I'm not all right, so write this down because you'll, you'll do this. On, I can remember sitting on boards going. Okay, so if you don't know this, write it down. Marilyn Monroe really always gets her man L.A., California. All right. So, Marilyn, what does that stand for? M. Um, macular. Macular. Monroe. Um, mucopolysaccharides. Yeah, mucopolysaccharides really Recessive. So, always. Um, amyloid. Oh, so you got to know these. Got to know these. Don't guess. So another thing, you know, if you're ever on oral boards, don't guess. 
the, the, guys do, the guy who does it will go, mm-hmm, tell me more. And then you just get deeper and deeper. So the key thing when you're in a hole, first thing you do, stop shoveling. All right, so always ocean blue. So the nice thing is it tells you what it is, it tells you what the material is, it tells you what the stain is, and that really gets thrown in because this is the only one that's recessive. So that's all you have to remember. The other two are dominant. So macular, mucopolysaccharide, recessive, ocean blue. So macular, you can get little round-like deposits, but usually it's more diffuse, and the key thing is it's not clear in between. It's hazy even in between the deposits. So this is macular, and the material is mucopolysaccharide. The stain is ocean blue. And so it'll stain the mucopolysaccharide material blue. <coughs> And there's another stain of this mucopolysaccharide material in the stroma. Gets. Uh, granular. Her. Uh, it's hyaline. Hyaline. Man. Um, Masson trichrome. Exactly. So this is now granular dystrophy. It looks like little cookie crumbs all over the stroma. And the key thing is in between the cookie crumbs, it's clear. Also, the, the deposits are more central, and there's a clear zone in the periphery by the limbus. And so it's a granular dystrophy. It's more specific focal granules. And this is on retroillumination, showing you these big cookie crumbs that are all over. And then the stain is Masson's trichrome. And so it'll stain this deposition red. The trichrome stains the stroma blue, but the deposition will be red. All right. Allie, L, lattice, lattice. A, amyloid. amyloid, California, carbo red, exactly. So you see lattice, very descriptive. It's got these little lattice lines all through the stroma. And if you stain it with Congo red, Congo red's kind of a misnomer. It's not really red, it's more orange, but in any event, burnt orange. And so you see the amyloid deposits that are in the stroma. And then what's a fun thing I love to do at the microscope? You haven't been with me, but any of you guys, what, what can you do with Congo red stain? What does it do? Exactly. So you get cross polarization. So if you put <coughs> Polaroid filters on there and you cross them, you will get the amyloid will light up. And I thought this was a cool picture. It's kind of hard to get a good picture of that. But this is the amyloid lighting up with cross polarization. So if you remember that mnemonic, you will know what you need to know about corneal stromal dystrophies. So put that to memory. Marilyn Monroe really always gets her man, LA, California. Teresa, what the heck is this? So it looks like limbus to limbus, there's like a pacification of the cornea with like ingrowth of blood vessels. Yeah, so just this is really hard to tell because this doesn't signify anything, but reason I showed you this is not all amyloid deposition is lattice. And so you can actually get amyloidosis causing corneal deposition, either systemically or locally. So this happens to be a cornea with severe amyloidosis. And this is all amyloid deposited throughout the cornea. And again, this is a Congo red stain and I'm trying to cross polarize it. It's kind of turning yellow instead of lighting up. So you can get amyloid you know, that's separate from lattice dystrophy affecting the cornea. All right, what are we seeing here, Sneha? Central haziness, uh, little dots on there. Yeah, almost like there's little granular dots on there. And then you look at retroillumination. If you look at the beam, these are deep. So this is really deep now. So this has gone beyond the stroma. This is actually now in the area of what we call an endothelial dystrophy. So what do you see that's got all these little irregular dots posteriorly? Um, okay. And this is Fuchs, exactly. So these are gutata, little deposits on Decimase membrane from endothelial cells that are affected by this dystrophy. So this is Fuchs dystrophy. And um, what is it characterized by pathologically? So these are gutata, these little excrescences 
on Decimase membrane, but look at how thick Decimase membrane is. So you get massive diffuse thickening of Decimase membrane, and you get guttata, and the endothelial cells eventually break down. And so you'll get corneal edema is kind of the final um, issue with Fuchs dystrophy. And so thickened Decimase membrane, multiple excrescences, which are called guttata, and then the endothelial cells eventually die off. Now, there is a, a condition called guttata-less Fuchs. There can be Fuchs without guttata, and that can be diagnosed only by professor corneal chairman attendings. And so Randy Olson's the only living human I know who can diagnose guttata-less Fuchs at a slit lamp. Mere mortals can't. It's the equivalent of the S1 murmur that the cardiologist can hear and nobody else can. So Dr. Olson can diagnose guttata-less Fuchs, but mere mortals, we have trouble doing that. So, but there is such a thing. We've actually seen Fuchs where there's thick endosomase membrane and no guttata. So rare, but usually you see the excrescences, the guttata. What are we looking at here, uh, Ariana? This is Munson sign showing keratoconus. Okay. So this is a gentleman looking down and look at the indentation of the eyelid or you know, outside part of the eyelid, how it's cone-shaped instead of round. And so this is severe keratoconus. It's called Munson sign. So if you look at look down, you can actually see the cone-shaped cornea. Now, obviously, we've got superficial topography now. We can diagnose this at a much earlier stage. But this is keratoconus, and it's still lumped into the category of dystrophies. And so we're not sure what it is. Some people call this an anterior dystrophy or a Bowman's layer or a basement membrane dystrophy. But if you look at it, what's the pathology that characterizes keratoconus? Here we see a uh, break in the Bowman's layer. Okay, so that's the classic sign, a little focal break in Bowman's layer. Now, you'll also get thinning of the stroma, especially inferiorly, and then you'll get that cone-shaped outpouching. But when you look at it pathologically, there'll be multiple areas of little focal breaks in Bowman's. And that's why people think that this should be classified as maybe an anterior or Bowman's dystrophy. So this is keratoconus. Um, boy, along that line, what's going on here, Rachel? Um, okay, so this is a keratoconus patient. And he was going along doing fine with his special contact lenses and then said, wow, suddenly yesterday my vision became totally blurry in that eye. And you see this. And that can, that can happen like called high drops? Right? High drops. So what is high drops? When it's like acute you know, or focal swelling of the cornea, it's opacified by all the, um, the water that flows into the cornea. And, and what is exactly the event that happens that causes this? There's a break in Decimase membrane. And so what stain is this again? PAS. PAS. And so here you can see a patient with high drops. There's a break in Decimase. So the way I think about it simplistically is that, that it's, it's usually not in early keratoconus. It's in advanced keratoconus. So that cone stretches and stretches and stretches and stretches and stretches. And finally, Decimase just breaks. And so because Decimase is pretty elastic, when it breaks, it curls in. And then you can imagine that fluid from the anterior chamber just pours into the cornea, so you get acute edema. Now, if you can get the patient through this, you don't have to do an emergent cornea transplant. I mean, fortunately, they did here, so I could get a good path picture. But you don't have to do that. Eventually, what can happen is the endothelial cells adjacent to it can slide over and fill the gap and then reestablish that linkage, and, and it'll lead to just that cornea eventually, but that can take months for that to happen. And so, stop that. Quit yawning, it's contagious. All you guys, both you two, stop that. <laughs> so this can eventually get better if you give it enough time, but, but oftentimes, you know, the edema takes a long time to get better. So you get that focal break in decimase, and you look at the close-up, decimase is elastic, it curls around on itself, but there's still viable endothelial cells, so eventually they'll slide over and fill the gap. All right, now we're going to talk a, a little bit about some other different things that can occur. Marshall. 
what's going on here and what kind of stain is this? Um, I think it's a trichrome stain. Uh, I'm not sure. Um, in terms of what's going on, there seems to be um, like extracellularity in the epithelium. Well, you've got some staining, some positive staining of some stuff that's kind of in that epithelial basement membrane. And actually, this is a Prussian blue stain. What is Prussian blue stain? Nope. It's in the epithelium, but what does it stain specifically? What material? I'm not sure. Iron. So this is an iron stain. Prussian blue stains iron. How do we remember that? Who were the Prussians? They were the militarists from eastern part of Germany that, that really built up Germany and started World War I. <coughs> and so when you think of Prussian blue, you think of iron. And what, what does iron make? Tanks, you know, shells, cannons. And so iron. And so Prussian blue stains iron. And so this is an iron stain. Now, why would I be showing you an iron stain of the cornea right after I showed you keratoconus? Exactly. So you can get an iron stain in a ring at the base of a keratoconus called a what? Leisure ring. Leisure ring, exactly. Now, remember, anywhere you get stasis of tears where there's an irregularity next to it, tears can pool, you'll get an iron stain. So you can get an iron stain at the head of a pterygium, you can get the iron stain where a, a bleb comes over, you can even get just an iron stain normally where the lid sits. So those are called hudson stolly lines, and so you can get iron stains anywhere that you get, as I said, an elevated area and then some pooling of tears next to it. So this happens to be an iron stain at the base of a keratoconus, a Fleischer ring. Chris, what is this thing? <clears throat> Looks like um, uh, an external specimen of a probably a failed corneal graft. Is what it looks like. There's okay. a lot of ossification, probably edema. Is what it's causing it. Yeah. So you can see all the little sutures that were on there, and of course this has been cut in half. We're going to process the other half, and you see that it's markedly edematous. It's it's opaque. It's thickened, and so this is a sign of just chronic corneal edema. So corneal edema, what's the final common denominator that leads to edema? Um, problems with endothelial cells? Exactly. So chronic endothelial damage. So failed graft, um, high pressure, inflammation. For whatever reason, the endothelial cells get damaged enough, and then you end up getting edema. And so you get um, a corneal edema there. And when we look at the actual pathology on this specimen, what do we see in here? So you're seeing a break here between the epithelium and bone. This is, this is seeing a break here. Huh? Exactly. So this is bullae. A bullae is just a big blister. So this is bullous <coughs> keratopathy. And it's important. This is a PAS stain. Look, the basement membrane is still on bones. And so the fluid percolates through the cornea. It causes swelling of the basal layer of the cells. Eventually, those cells will swell. They'll pop. And then you'll get a bullae or a blister. So this is bullous keratopathy. And again, it's kind of an end stage of whatever's going on to, you know, to cause that endothelium to dysfunction, and then eventually you'll get swelling in there. So this is bolus keratopathy. It's a sign of corneal edema. Now, you can't call edema by looking at the stroma because during normal processing, the stroma will shrink, and there'll be these little spaces in between. So you can't call edema by looking at the spaces in between. You call it by looking at the bullae and the edema, the epithelium. This is bullous keratopathy. Now, all right, again, we say goodbye to the Eiffel Tower, Paris at night. Questions regarding cornea? Yeah.